Get a Book Dot Today presents Fleet Commander Recon, Book 4 in the Starships at War series by Shane Lachlan Black, copyright 2018. Chapter 27 The magneto lift hatch opened, and a semi reconstructed Lieutenant Hawkins stepped onto deck two of the starship Exeter. At her feet, Rebel, Wave, and Intercept escorted her step by step with all their early warning systems and weapons at the ready. Rebel, in particular, was at his highest possible alert level, with his main gun at full power and his battle screens at maximum. If there was going to be a fight, the minibot main tank would be ready. With her Echo brand polymer cast supporting one leg, Lieutenant Hawkins was forced to walk with a bit of a limp, but the quality of the mobile trauma unit's work was sturdy enough there was no pain. Hawkins wondered if perhaps AC's field medical unit would be capable of producing prosthetics as easily. She applied the cast in a matter of seconds. It shouldn't be much trouble to build nearly any kind of appliance. Hawkins leaned against the bulkhead and checked her Atmos handheld. According to the best data available to her, what was left of the intruder forces was concentrated on the engineering deck. For reasons she would have to figure out later, they didn't seem to be all that interested in the warship's control mechanisms on the higher decks. So far, the artificial gravity and life support systems were still operational, which meant she wouldn't have to navigate the passages and compartments by walking or crawling on the ceiling. Even so, the lieutenant had equipped herself with a pair of electromagnetic boots not long after retrieving a TK-10 blaster pistol from the Deck 4 armory. She was fully aware of the fact intruders could be on Deck 2 and masking their positions somehow. She needed help. The lieutenant keyed her comlink. Hawkins to bridge. Acknowledge. She waited the regulation ten seconds but got no response. Echo, are you in contact with anyone on Deck 2 or the bridge? I can't hear them either, Brittany. I'm scared. Someone should have called us back by now. Butterfly, what about you? I can't hear anything on our deck. Hawkins advanced, pistol raised wrist over wrist with a handheld light in her offhand. Her destination was the engineering auto control substation, which was situated just below the command deck along the forward edge of Exeter's deck two. The lights were only intermittently operational, but it was still possible for the little company to pick its way forward with a combination of wave searchlights, Rebel's battlefield array, and the occasional working deck lamp along the sides of the passageways leading to the forward compartment. She moved carefully, well aware of the fact Exeter was fully compromised and she had only one sidearm. She did have the assistance of a team of little electronic helpers with more than a few unique capabilities. After stopping at the third dark universal console she had located, she was in the process of trying to synchronize her Atmos handheld to it when Butterfly spoke up. AC taught us how to make those work. Brittany leaned back, cognizant of how close the little helicopter's blades were to the side of her head. Yeah? Can you reactivate this one? Rebel can, Echo replied. How are we going to get him all the way up here? That's easy. Butterfly descended to an altitude of a few feet and extended her lifter cables. In a matter of moments, she had lifted the big tank high enough so his console analysis sensors were level with the universal. He connected his own power systems to the unit and configured the unit for data bypass. Echo, transmit and receive on Skywatch Fleet Frequency 6. Affirmative, transceiver ready. Using Echo as a relay, Rebel established an ad hoc data link between the Universal and the Deck Alert subsystems deployed throughout the rest of the ship. Universal console activated, Rebel said. Yay, Echo cheered. How much power do we have? Butterfly descended carefully. Rebel's prodigious weight settled on the deck. 
he immediately deployed his main gun to cover the trailing approach leading to the magneto lifts while the miniature helicopter retracted her lift cables. We cannot bypass the power relays without engineers and tools. The power circuits are all hard connections inside the conduit. I recharged the local reserve to 5%. The console will operate for approximately 20 minutes. We... Intercept vanished. Intruders! <laughs> We're not going to put up with that again after getting the lieutenant back in one piece. Wave muttered as he shifted into reverse and backed out of Rebel's way. A moment later, a plasma bolt whispered through the passageway and ripped a strobing gash in the bulkhead. Sparks showered across the deck. Brittany instinctively covered her head and stumbled back, trying to get behind her little defenders and raise her weapon at the same time. Rebel redirected his main battery up the hallway and rolled forward. He returned fire, punching a foot-wide hole in the far bulkhead. The light illuminated two darkly dressed attackers as they ducked back. The little tank stopped and fired again. The concussion burst filled the deck with a percussive sound and made the deck plates rattle. Get him, Rebel! Get him! Echo shouted. The intruders leaned into the passage and fired again. Long, thin bolts of energy flashed. Impacts tore into metal and composite. One of the few working deck lights went dark, which only made the weapons fire more eerie and disorienting. Hawkins fired angrily with her TK-10. The lighter round scored the barriers at the far end of the passage. Without better lighting, it was difficult to see her targets. Then one of the intruders inexplicably lit up like he had suddenly appeared center stage at a performance of Les Miserables. At his feet was intercept. The little police car's capacitance weapons were at full power. Finally, there was a snapping sound, and the intruder slumped to the floor. Hawkins stared in shock. She didn't even know the little security vehicle had traveled that far down the passage, but she had to admit he got one of the attackers with his electric shocks. A moment later, a second intruder appeared. Before Rebel could redirect his main gun, the attacker fired. Its weapon impacted Intercept's windshield at point-blank range. The little car spun backwards and clattered against the bulkhead. Its systems all went dark at once. A moment later, Rebel's third main battery war shot slammed into the intruder's chest. It wheeled back and cracked its head against the metal wall before collapsing to the deck. Intercept! Echo shouted. The little ambulance rolled up alongside the still-smoking security unit. Intercept! Respond! The black and white car remained dark and didn't move. Wake up! Echo pleaded. She activated all her hailing subroutines, attempting to establish some kind of connection with her companion. Nothing. Rebel! Help him! The big tank rolled up in front of Intercept, directing a powerful spotlight towards him. Brittany watched, fascinated, as the little robots gathered around their friend. The little car's front-facing window told the story. A five-inch gouge had been torn in his hood and had shattered the crystal surface of his windshield, which was more accurately just part of the unit's hull. Rebel's optical pickup noted the frightening damage to Intercept's internal circuitry. His capacitance weapons were disabled, and all his forward data transfer circuits were dark. The vehicle's power systems were also offline. This unit cannot be repaired on the battlefield. We need AC. He sacrificed himself to save the ship, Butterfly said, just like AC taught us. He was a good minibot, Echo said. He didn't know he wasn't supposed to attack by himself. We must proceed, Rebel said. We can't just leave him here, Luna replied, hovering over the formation. Butterfly, lift him into my transport deck. I will make sure we get him home, Wave said. As she watched the minibots care for their comrade, Brittany couldn't help but feel responsible. Intercept wouldn't have rushed forward like that unless she had tried to retake Deck 2 on her own. She didn't want to get blasted by the enemy, but she also didn't want to have to explain to Commander Hunter she was the reason one of her prized cybernetics experiments had been shot to pieces. Finally, the still unresponsive Intercept had been loaded into Wave's pickup bed and secured for transport. Standing by, Wave said. Minibots, advance, Rebel ordered. He pivoted on his tracks and rolled forward, turning to pick his way around the two bodies in the passage. Wave followed, carrying intercept. The other bots and Hawkins made their way up the passage as well, with the lieutenant limping on her still-solid cast. It wasn't far to the engineering substation. Chapter 28 The bell to Captain Flynn's quarters sounded. Come. The port opened to reveal acting exo-lieutenant Barnes. His expression belied a certain optimism, which was a welcome sight aboard the Constellation given the events of the last ten hours. 
Captain Flynn was just completing his preparations to lead the shift change to first watch. He finished scrubbing his hair and threw the towel over the back of a nearby chair. He was wearing the blue camo version of his duty uniform, without the cap this time. Raymond Flynn wasn't a fan of headwear on duty. Scott, you look like a man with good news. You asked for an update when Stiles and Osway were ready to compile a report. They've been at it all night, and I think we may have a story to go with some of the data we've gathered along Bion 3's orbit. I'm always in the mood for answers, Lieutenant. Where are they now? Deck 2 Operations Lab. I'm rotating off, but I'll man the bridge until you're ready. Very well. Log our shift change and maintain readiness levels. I'll be up in a minute. The two officers exited Flynn's quarters and went in opposite directions. After navigating a few sets of metal stairs and a short lift ride up two decks, Captain Flynn strode into the operations lab to find two rather disheveled-looking bridge officers hunched over their data terminals. Attention on deck. Both men rose to stand on unsteady legs. As you were. Once you've given me the report, I want both of you in the rack. Aye, sir, that would be most welcome about now, Lieutenant Osway replied. He was one of Constellation's best signals officers, and his expression reminded the skipper of his XO just a little. Whatever these men had found, it was big. What have you got? Ensign Stiles picked up the handheld universal and activated the crystal display. The schematic for a strange-looking weapon assembly appeared with a Skywatch Library computer reference index attached. This is an experimental weapon system developed by Skywatch Command four years ago. It is based on technology stolen from a breakaway faction of planet raiders based in the Prairie Grove system. They used income derived from fraudulent triluminum claims to buy off certain elements in the raider organization. Where they originally obtained this design is unknown, but what we do know is the function of this technology is to defeat spacecraft equipped with beam weapons. Beam weapons, Flynn repeated. Aye, Captain, Osway replied. This weapon is called a rifle cutter. It intercepts the energy channel formed by deep space plasma, laser and particle beam weapons, uses its energy to create an amplified feedback pulse, and then uses the initial energy conduit formed by the attacking weapon as an electromagnetic wire, along which it can fire a disruptive counterpulse directly into the attacking ship's drive field. Sounds formidable. It's a highly dangerous and effective design, sir. The reason it is so effective is because it can bypass both a drive field and battle screens. Used properly, this weapon could be devastating to a beam-equipped starship, regardless of class. Its only limitations are range and capacitance. Large-scale weapons like Havocs, for example, could overload it. Rifle cutters can also only handle one beam at a time, so a vessel armed with multiple batteries could also overwhelm it. I'm sold. The next time we put in for a refit, we'll pick up a couple. Why are we studying rifle cutters, gentlemen? Because the Three Moon Faction ship was using these as primaries, sir. That's why they tried to evade us instead of engaging, Osway replied. It's also why I think they backed down so quickly and retreated, Stiles added. Against a ship like Exeter, they would have been very effective. Against a missile destroyer, however... There's no beam weapon to feed back against, Flynn concluded. Very interesting, gentlemen. Do we have any records of this three-moon bunch in our data banks? Negative, sir. Our little tangle eight hours ago was first contact. Well, I suppose we've set the tone for a grand friendship, Flynn replied in a deadpan tone. What are the chances we could work up a doctrine of some kind for engaging these weep? Flynn's comlink beeped. Bridge to Captain. Flynn. We're being hailed, sir. Bye. Commander Jace Hunter aboard the Psy Key, sir. Flynn and his two exhausted officers exchanged wide-eyed looks. Patch the channel to my comlink bridge. A pause. Good morning, Captain. The sound of Jace's voice put smiles on all three of the Constellation's officers' faces. Commander, am I glad to hear your voice. Welcome to the search for the missing planet. What is your position? We're half a click inside the Blackburn Gate approaching the Bayon 4 interdiction zone. We have some interesting information for you. Rendezvous with our squadron at Hallow's Moon. Acknowledged, Psy Key. We'll be there. Constellation out. Aboard Jace's vessel, the bridge crew was busy processing the new information from Constellation's data link. What's on Hallow's Moon? My brother found a destroyed base down there. Whatever happened to the Alaska installation happened before Atwell's attack on our amphibious forces. I think he used the 98th as a test run, 
and if we can figure out his strategy against Major Charton, I think it will give us an advantage when we get back on the surface of Bayon 3. Exo, you're with me. My engineer tells me we've got a working theory on our scattering field device. Pilot, steady as she goes. I want a parabolic evasive course to the far side of Hallow's Moon. Maintain electronic warfare posture. Weps, you have the con. Psy Key and Minstrel were flying in a standard trailing wing combat formation. Hunter's course intended to take them high over Bayon 3's projected orbit into the path of Bayon 4's perihelion approach. This would put them on the planet side of Hallow's Moon and maintain maximum concealment against any potential enemies lurking in the path of the out of phase planet. Commander Hunter and Lieutenant Winchester took full advantage of the compact ship's facilities for getting from one deck to the next. After a few semi-orthodox detours, both officers climbed down a partial ladder apparatus and let themselves fall the last seven feet to the lowest engineering deck, where Yeely, Zoni, Cobb, and Admiral Hughes were busy examining the aftmost bulkhead of the ship with an ultraviolet scanner. Attention on deck, Cobb said. Stand easy, Hunter replied. Engineer, you promised me an explanation of all this. These markings are power conduits, Yeely said. Aboard this ship, any mark with the proper shape and size carved into any metal surface channels some kind of carrier wave that, for lack of a better term, harmonizes with the energy in the scattering field. By using what is generated by all of these glyphs at once, the Psi Key can activate the interface unit and shift out of four-dimensional space. Once there, these markings serve as a map of sorts, so the ship knows which direction to go in the wormhole. Once the destination is reached, the interface unit recalibrates the vessel's physical structure, and it reappears in normal space-time. That is one hell of an explanation, Commander, Hunter said. So you're saying these glyphs, as you call them, are some kind of magic writing that makes the ship capable of traveling through dimensions? Essentially correct. If I didn't have the proper equipment to analyze them, I'd say these markings could easily be mistaken for magical writing. There's more, Zoni said. As if what we just heard wasn't enough, Winchester quipped. We did an element analysis on the metal Yili sampled from EDEC, Tixia continued. There is no change in the Psi Key's composition, but those markings contain elements that have never been detected by our science. They are completely new atoms, and they are capable of binding with various stable elements in ways that we haven't had time to even speculate about, much less experiment with. Is it possible those elements got into our space through the Raleo obelisk? Hunter asked. A distinct possibility, ma'am. Pretty much everything we've encountered so far leads back to Raleo 2 in some way, Cobb replied. Which is why that planet is high on my priority list, Hunter said. Is there anything we're likely to encounter on Hallow's Moon or Bayon 3 that this information could be useful in overcoming? Now that I know what to look for, it's very likely this technology is being used to outmaneuver our efforts to figure out what Atwell is doing. You were right in assuming his secrets were hidden in this ship. It stands to reason he's using what we've found here to advance the rest of his plan, Curtis replied. What about Lethe Deeps? Hunter asked. That was my first thought, too, Zoni replied. We need to get back in there and find out what the colonel is up to now that we've raided his little bag of tricks, Yili said. The first time, we had no idea what we were witnessing in there. Now I think the deeper we go into that base, the more of this mystery we're going to unravel. Somewhere down there is the key to defeating the Ithis and possibly a lot more. Now for the crucial question. Can we use this to get back into Bayon 3? Hunter asked. Affirmative, ma'am. If the planet is in the same location in the interface, we can use our ship's instruments to detect its phase. Then we can calibrate our emitter to match its matter-energy frequency. That will allow us to penetrate the barrier with ship and crew intact, Yili said. Right through the front door, Zoni added. Ladies and gentlemen, this is outstanding work, Hunter said. I'll be sure to have your commendations forwarded to whatever brig we all end up occupying when this is over. Yes, ma'am, Saab replied, grinning. The commander activated her comm link. Hunter to bridge. ETA to Hallow's Moon approach. Sixteen minutes, ma'am. Very well. Notify Minstrel. Take us to alert condition two. Stand by battle station's energy. Plot course for Hallow's Moon high orbit. Act Noel wedged. Engineer, get all this information packaged appropriately and transmit to commanders Minstrel and Constellation. I want them fully briefed about what's going on with this scattering field. Chapter 29 I detect a multi-phase coded transmission originating from the starship Psy Key.
I am reasonably confident the commander has consolidated her strategic plans against enemy forces nearby, and I perform an immediate analysis on the data recovered from the transmission to confirm my evaluation. What I encounter in the data is both instructive and fascinating. It is clear the commander remains unaware of my presence in the Bion system. I have taken great care to match my course and speed to that of the starship Psy Key. If her navigational computers detect my position, they should continue to interpret the telemetry as a likely sensor reflection. I am relying on this strategy to avoid tripping the Psy Key's threat board. Although the commander can no longer disable my Cephalon Matrix with her blocking routine, there are several means by which she could conclude my involvement in this mission. Acting Commander Sabrina Mallory is aboard the Psy Key. Even though she is ostensibly equal in rank to Commander Hunter, at the moment Jace remains the ranking officer in this system. As such, she could issue an order to Acting Commander Mallory, who in turn could issue an order to this unit to stand down. Since Acting Commander Mallory is the next highest ranking officer in my chain of command, I would have no choice but to follow her orders. As a warship with full access to the Battleship Argent's library computers, I have had many opportunities to review the various events that took place during Captain Hunter's Gitarn mission. At certain crucial moments, it seems his strategies were either thwarted or at the very least interrupted by the sudden introduction of what can only be described as anomalous events. It is now clear to this unit the technology responsible for the majority of those events is the scattering field employed by Colonel Zachariah Atwell and possibly by alien elements either sympathetic to or allied with his cause. Certain elements of the forces arrayed against the battleship Argent were apparently able to either construct or recover physical devices capable of turning scattering field energy into the power necessary to take advantage of the ability to transport persons, equipment, or starships from one location to another instantly. This made it possible for the enemy to attack Task Force Perseus at Station 19 and to transport an entire crew from the decks of Argent in Bion 3 orbit. What I have learned is vitally important information, as it will allow this unit and others in the service of Skywatch and Captain Hunter to anticipate and prepare for the eventual use or reuse of this technology. Commander Hunter's prescient study of these events is commendable, as other officers could have just as easily overlooked the advantages of integrating the Ithis technology into their own plans. Now that our forces are operating on a more or less even basis with our enemies, Victory is no longer a function of technological advantage alone, but more a function of superior strategy. In this I compute a high probability our side retains the advantage, as Captain Hunter and Commander Hunter are both formidable adversaries, not only due to their experience and aggressive personalities, but also due to their predilection for the unusual. I compute a 91.446% probability Commander Hunter intends to use the scattering field technology to create a means of bypassing the interface boundary between normal space and the temporary dimensional shift of Bayon 3. According to the data she has transmitted to the other two ships in her formation, the use of the Psy Key's teleportation device will create a powerful zone of anti-time at the approximate coordinates of her formation's transit to Bayon 3 orbit. This zone will sustain the interface bypass for a period of several seconds, possibly as long as a minute, during which there will be a possibility of two-way transit between Bion 3 space and normal space. This will be a unique opportunity to perform a rescue operation and possibly evacuate civilians to a safe location. Captain Hunter would undoubtedly approve of such a mission, and I know he will be pleased if I am able to perform it effectively. According to Skywatch records, there are approximately 260 children on the surface of Bion 3, a population far beyond my passenger capacity. Even if I disengage my safety protocols, my life support systems can only sustain nine humans for any appreciable length of time. To rescue more than nine of the children, I will have to make multiple transits, and the window for the interface anti-time zone is likely to last a maximum of 60 seconds. It will not be possible to reach the settlement, locate the civilian's position, board the passengers, and return to orbit in such a short time. Therefore, I must prioritize which children to evacuate. While this could be considered a cruel decision, the alternative is to leave all the children in harm's way, which is unacceptable to both this unit and undoubtedly to the captain. It remains to be seen if it will even be possible to approach the Starhaven settlement, recover the evacuees, and return to orbit in time to take advantage of the anti-time zone.
I compute a chance of no more than 19.67%, even if I encounter no unexpected problems, that I will be able to lift evacuees back to orbit in time to return to normal space. I must consider alternatives. I consult the latest maps of the Bayon surface and apply the tactical overlays provided by Major Daria Komanov. Although it was the site of at least one engagement, it appears the Lethe Deep's planetary defense base perimeter may be the safest and most easily defended landing site, relatively speaking, within practical range of Commander Hunter's command. Unless she intends something truly impossible to predict, she will more than likely choose to set down at or near the garrison for the 14th Infantry, as that location will provide her and the formation with the most numerous formidable strategic options. I will evacuate Abren Willets, call sign Parakeet, and at least eight others to that location as soon as possible.